And I looked at Aiden and especially his two younger brothers who are much taller than they were the last time I saw them. And I remember when the kids came back on Easter Sunday and we were outside celebrating, that I looked at them and I said to one of them, you're growing like a weed. And she looked at me like, what? Someone yesterday said, these, I've known these boys since they were knee high to a grasshopper. And they looked like, what kind of old person saying is that? But growing like a weed, how many of you understand all too well what growing like a weed means? If you came to my yard, you'd really see a great sermon illustration there. I have a bed that I did not plant. I just get the benefits of it, full of daylilies, but these long, tall things shot up right in the middle of them. Last year, I waited to see what they were, what they would bloom into, and they were just weeds, and they're back this year. And I thought to myself as I looked out my window yesterday, someone should go and cut those things down. No one has so far. <laughs> now, when Jesus tells a story, we all think, oh, it's the Lord, we must sit and go, ha. Oh. But Jesus knew a good joke when he heard one, and he told a lot of good jokes, and he told some stories that would make people go, what are you talking about? And this is one of them. Because who goes out and sows weeds? None of you. It would be like saying a modern-day thing. So Jesus goes in front of the disciples in the crowd, and he says to them, the kingdom of heaven is like a dandelion, that somebody went and blew the seeds across their lawn. Would you do that in a million years if you were over 10 years old? No because you would get such a crop of dandelions from that. And those are considered to be weeds. So what is Jesus talking about here? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. No one would go out and throw mustard seeds around. And how many of you have ever passed that yellow field and said, oh, that's so beautiful, and then realized it's a seed of wild mustard that's taken off? And Jesus says, even though the seed starts small, that it grows and grows and grows until it becomes a shrub. It's big enough to house a bird's nest, and it gives a home to the birds. Now remember, this is Jesus talking in Matthew's Gospel, which started out with that great Sermon on the Mount beginning in chapter 5 that says, the birds, look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, unless you're, and yet your heavenly Father takes care of them and feeds them and gives them a place to nest. So what does this mean for us about this mustard seed kind of faith becoming the kingdom of heaven? And again, this isn't heaven when you die. This isn't up in the sky somewhere because... If you remember what Jesus says himself, he's going to bring heaven to earth when he returns. It's not even about that reality of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a time, it's not a place, it's the time when Christ and Christ rules alone. It's going to come in its fullness when Christ returns, but it is with us now. We just have to choose to see it and we have to choose to live in it by choosing to be his disciples, which is our choice always. Now, some of you are my Facebook friends, not just Emily, but some of you are. And lots of clergy commented on a picture that was put on my page because this week when I was on vacation, I got to have breakfast with three of my colleagues who are also three of my dear friends. One is Margaret, and we had breakfast this week because she is retiring and moving to Ohio. The other is my friend Deline that I hang out with all the time. And then there was a woman sitting there, if you saw the picture, with a, a pink Washington Nationals cap on over her very bald head right now. It's my friend Lisa Bandel, who is getting ready to start her radiation treatments following chemotherapy, and she's lost all her hair. Now, about 20-some years ago, I was sitting in the Board of Ordained Ministry. I used to be on the Board of Ordained Ministry so long as the group that examines people who want to be ordained in the Baltimore-Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church. I was there when Bill Brown came through. I was there when um, Kim came through, Trish came through, and oh, I can't, what was her name? Kate. Kate, I knew best. I'm up here blanking out. When Kate came through. And I was sitting there, which we do, when people get up one at a time. If you can imagine being a young, new seminary graduate or just about ready to graduate from seminary, and you have to stand up in front of 60 or 70 people and tell your story as they all sit and take notes so they remember you. I'm sitting there taking notes, and this young woman comes into the room, and she says, hello, my name is Lisa. And um, she said, you know, I never really paid much attention in church, and I didn't go to Sunday school or youth group, but you could ask Terry, and she could tell you that. I looked around. I was the only Terry in the room, and I thought, how could I tell anything about this woman I'm just meeting for the first time? And later she said, you don't remember me, do you? And she said, you were the student assistant pastor at Glenelg Church when I was in middle school. And I said, you're what? And I was only in my 30s then. And she said, you didn't recognize me, did you? I said, you were 12 or 13 then. I was 25. I have changed less in 25 to 30-whatever than you have between 13 and 20-whatever. 
But she told a story that has stuck with me all these years, and I actually called her last night and said, is that okay if I use you as a sermon illustration tomorrow morning? She said, go for it. I would be honored to be in your sermon tomorrow morning. She told the story because she said, you know, I really didn't go to church that much. I went to church. She said, I didn't pay that much attention in church, and I never went to Sunday school or youth group, but I was in an accident. Lisa's very athletic, always has been, sports in high school, everything else. She's a golf player. I don't understand golf, but she's a golf player, loves golf. She was riding in a golf cart with a friend of hers who was driving. She said he was going way too fast. She was telling him, please slow down, when he went around a corner and flipped the cart. And she was pinned underneath. The first words out of her mouth were, Jesus Christ. And then she said, she said, God, please get this off me. Now, the driver was thrown out of the cart, and he was able to get the cart off her, and she ended up with just some bad bruises. But she said that made her think. If that's the first name that comes to your mind when something happens, and the first words following that are a prayer, then there is a seed that was planted in her heart so many years before that she needed to nurture. She started to nurture that seed and then became an ordained pastor in the United Methodist Church. And as I just told you, she has no hair right now because she has breast cancer. And it's not good. But she's fighting it. And she serves now as the chaplain at Mercy Hospital in Baltimore, ministering to others who are sick or facing uncertain futures. And she begins her, hopefully, proton therapy radiation very soon. The day she's scheduled to go back to work is the first day of her radiation therapy. But she's going to keep plugging along. And I was amazed a few years ago at an annual conference because I was sitting there watching ordination. Lisa was the sponsor for a young woman pastor who had been in her congregation when she was a kid. The kingdom of heaven is small, like a grain of mustard seed, but it spreads like wildfire, grows like a weed. And then Jesus talks about the yeast. Now, how many of you ever saw an episode of I Love Lucy, or all of them? Do you remember when she bakes bread and she opens the oven and it shoots out the door? You know, it's bigger than the oven by 10 times. That's the kingdom of God. We can make a joke about it, but that's the kingdom of God. I love to bake, and I bake some pretty daggone good bread if I do say so myself. But if you mix the yeast in, it's going to grow, and it's going to grow, and it's going to grow. And you're not even going to see it happening, but it will, you know, you cover up that bowl of dough, and you come back an hour later, and it's twice the size that it was. The kingdom of heaven is like that if we let it work in our hearts. Now, in my former congregation, and the one before that, I had a family, and I have known Thomas Jefferson Lyons since before he was born, before he was even, as they say, the glimmer in his daddy's eye. His family was in church all the time, but I remember the day his mom said, we're having number four, let's hope it's a girl, and it was, and it was the fourth boy named after President of the United States, which is what happens when your father is a history teacher. But they were also names of the disciples. I brought that up to them. They said, that's not what we planned, but that's pretty cool. So Thomas was born on Palm Sunday. His first Sunday in church was Easter Sunday, and he missed very few after that. Now, because I like to bake bread, and I bake some pretty good bread, my incentive to get people to come to the 830 worship service was homemade bread for communion, hot homemade bread for communion. And you could smell it as soon as you hit the door of the church. We had a little chapel in that congregation as well as the main sanctuary. And we had the 830 service in the chapel because that was a small group of people. Thomas, when he could finally walk, would come down the hall. As soon as he smelled the bread, he'd go, mmm, 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 mmm. Then it became bread, bread, bread. And he'd come up to me on mornings without communion. He'd say, bread, bread. I said, no, not this Sunday, next Sunday. And then he'd come in bread. Then it was communion, communion, communion. And then my last Sunday, as his pastor, when he was 13 years old, he came up, crossed his hands, and I put the bread in his hand. I said, the body of Christ given for you. And he said, thanks be to God. And tears running down his face. The kingdom of heaven is like that. If we let it live in us, where we grow in our knowledge and our love of God, we grow in our witness. Now Thomas came to confirmation with his older brothers who were clueless at the time. They have grown on. They're grown now. They're great guys. But um, I was teaching confirmation and I do a lesson called Christians are like pizza. 
and we have all the makings of pizza there. I said, what's the first thing that happens with pizza? And they said, the sauce. So I poured sauce on the counter and I said, go ahead and cut it, boys, have a piece. And they said, no, 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 it's that other stuff, that bready stuff. And their mother was there with them and she said, talk about the crust. I said, oh yeah, the crust. I said, what is the crust? They said, that's what holds everything else together. And I said, what is the crust of being a Christian? They said, believing in God. And I said, well then, Muslims are Christians and Jews are Christians and Zoroastrians are Christian, Shintos are Christians, they got a lot of gods. And Thomas was five, and he said, Pass to Tawi. And it broke my heart when he learned to pronounce ours correctly. Pass to Tawi, I know the answer. I said, Shh, Thomas, let them, let them work on it. And they kept asking, and he kept saying, Pass to Tawi, I know the answer. I know the answer. I know the answer. Let me tell you the answer. Please, Pass to Tawi. And finally, after his brothers and the rest of the class stood there looking at me like deer in headlights, Thomas, I said, Thomas, what's the answer? And he said, Jesus was dead, and then he's alive again. I thought, I'm going to not just take you in with confirmation. I'm going to ordain you right here on the spot. Because at five years old, he knew the crust of Christianity, the basis of everything else. The deep roots of Christianity are the faith in Jesus Christ who died and was raised from the dead. We have the kingdom of God within us. We have the kingdom of heaven within us. We've got to nurture those seeds, which is why, what a lovely thing to celebrate graduates and fathers on the same day. Because, I, as I said before, and we're going to have a prayer for fathers later, even if your own father fell short, you had some man in your life who gave you what you needed, and your own father who gave you life, if nothing else. And those seeds that were planted in your heart, we hope will take root and grow. I love the epistle lesson as much as I love the gospel lesson. I love this epistle lesson, which is why it's going to be read at my funeral one day. Because I love what it says. It's a blessing. Paul's epistles were generally split in two. The first half theologizing, and the second half saying the so what question of what does that mean for us. And then he would talk about what it means to live in Christ, to be a Christian in the world, what it means ethically and morally, what it means for us to practice our faith that we proclaim. I love this because he always ends the first part with a blessing. Let me read that to you again. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If you ask me why I'm in the ministry, and some days I ask myself, why am I doing this? We had a saying back in seminary, I could have gone to welding school. Back in those days, it was $28 an hour. That was 35 years ago, $28 an hour, and there are no welding emergencies in the middle of the night. Nobody ever calls you to come weld something. But on those days when I say to myself, why did I do this? Someone will come to me and say, I want my baby baptized, or I want to be baptized. Someone will come to me and say, could you have communion with me so I can remember what it's about? My job is to convince people and pray that you may have the power to understand what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love for you in Jesus Christ. Because that's what's going to get you through the rough times in life. That's what's gotten me through the roughest times in my life. And I want you to know that. And I give my life to that every day that I get up. That is my mission and that is my job, to make you know how much you are loved. How deep is God's love for you in Jesus Christ. I like the second part too. Now to him who is by the power at work within us able to accomplish far more, abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. More than we can ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but I have a fabulous imagination. And God is able to do abundantly more than we could even imagine, what we could dream of, what we need. God is able to do that in our lives, and all it takes is a little bit of faith. Now, I am an advocate of drag your kids to church. Not your grown kids, but your kids. I'm an advocate of that because if you think I was born on the planet of pastors and that I just got up every day on Sunday and said, ooh, ooh, great, we get to get up early and get dressed up and go to church, you would be so wrong. My mother is here and she could probably shout amen at this one. But I got to be in college and I'm a baby boomer, which is why I can't remember people's names from time to time. 
that's another thing, but um, as a baby boomer, there were so many of us. I went to Towson, which we called York Road University back in the day. I went to Towson, and my best friend went to Hopkins, and because we lived within 25 miles of campus, we were not allowed to live on campus. They didn't have enough housing for all of us, so I had to live at home. But I was in college, and I was in charge of my own destiny, so I thought. Sunday morning came, my parents said, aren't you gonna go get up and dress, dress and go to church? I was like, nah, I don't think so. And they said, as long as you live under our roof. Seriously. Now, fast forward a few years, and I'm in my first appointment, uh, and a young woman from my congregation lived with me because I lived right around the corner from where she went to school at Anne Arundel Community College. I woke up on Sunday morning to go to church and went downstairs and found a living room full of drunken, passed out teenagers. I was not happy. As I woke them up and I said to her, as long as you're living under my roof, and I thought, where is my mother? Is she behind me saying that? Because those words came out of my mouth. And I called my mother and I said, can you believe that? I said, I'm glad it wasn't that obnoxious at her age. And my mother said to me, words that still ring true in my life, who told you that? Who told you you weren't obnoxious at that age? You certainly were. Now, people say to me, I want my kids to choose for themselves when they're grown what they believe in. It's not a choice. If you've never been to church, if you've never been exposed to the faith, I don't think you're going to wake up at 21 years old and say, let me get up, get dressed, get in the car and drive to a place where I don't know anybody, sit down in a room that seems really weird, listen to an organ that you maybe heard at the baseball stadium but no place else. It's like organ music. What in the world is that sound? Having prayers that you don't recognize to a God that you've never heard of. That's not a choice. That's a default setting. But let me tell you, through the years I've had people who have come to God that way. But I want people to bring their kids to church and let them experience the faith. I want you not just to bring them to church, but I want you to tell them at home what God has done in your life. What is the depth, the breadth, and the height, and the length of God's love for you in Jesus Christ? Because that will plant a seed that one day will come to fruition. They'll grow like weeds in their faith. I always love it when a kid tells me, oh, I'm going away to school. My parents cannot get to me there. Andrew was a kid like that. I loved Andrew. He, he was honest with me. He said, I'm not going to do this church thing in college. You're crazy. All the other kids said, I'm going to go to church every Sunday. And Andrew's like, yeah, right. Guess who the only one who went to church was? Andrew. Because he said, I just can't get out of this stinking habit of going to church. And when I had my knee surgery, he came to see me when he had just finished his doctorate. And he told me, that he was thinking about asking his girlfriend of several years to marry him because they'd been together so long. And he said, the problem is she doesn't want to go to church with me. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but that's something you got to work out. And he said, well, she told me she's Catholic and they're not required to go to church. And I said, I know a lot of priests who would disagree with that one. I said, just, you know, think about it, pray about it. I said, because if you don't share the same values, getting married is real tough. It's tough when you share the same values, isn't it? Amen? Some days. And he broke up with her, and I felt so guilty. I thought, did I do that? And he told me, no, 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 you didn't do that. My last official act as the pastor of that congregation was Andrew's wedding to a wonderful woman who went to church every Sunday. And it's not about going to church, but they decided that their faith was important enough to them that they wanted to make it a priority in their lives. And they had a wedding that was God-filled. And I mean, they're not... They're not so uppity, goody two-shoes. They don't just sit in the church and pray all day. But they decided that those seeds planted in their hearts when they were children, that they would allow to take root. We hope Ben and Emily and every other young person here, Miss Kaylee, Mr. Ethan back there, Mr. Aiden, who got his Eagle Scout yesterday, we hope that in some way Epworth Church has helped to nurture the faith in you so that you might be rooted and grounded in the love of God and Jesus Christ. If you, if you remember nothing else I say today, just remember how much God loves you in Jesus Christ. How much God loves you in Jesus Christ. And one day when you need it, it will be there for you. Just as it was for my pal Lisa when her golf cart rolled over and the first words out of her mouth were a prayer to God. And she decided to act on that. And I'm not saying you have to be a pastor. Heaven knows you don't have to be a pastor. But I hope that your faith will sustain you and nurture you. Because that's what gets us through.
this is my first Father's Day without my dad. This is, for a lot of folks, a difficult day because the person that you call dad is gone. For me, it was my father and my godfather. I grew up next door to my Uncle Johnny, who let me.